talk more about that later. Um, but really, I want to focus our attention on some soil issues. Um, in class today, you guys were looking at some of the methods we can use to prevent soil issues, like the no-till or conservation tillage, strip cropping, crop rotation, etc. Uh, we're going to focus on some of the problems that we're trying to prevent, one of which is soil erosion. So erosion, uh, you guys should know what that means. It's just the gradual wearing away. And the term soil erosion refers to taking the, those top layers of soil, the, the A and the O horizon, and allowing the wind and rain to slowly just kind of wash that away so that we're left with uh, less beneficial horizons. Okay? Um, and it's a problem because we rely on healthy, fertile soil to grow our food. It's also important for uh, habitats and so on. Um, and one of the things we do to help prevent the soil erosion in terms of losing nutrients is using fertilizers. But if we don't manage the soil, the O and A horizons for, for natural cycling, uh, which is going to cause more and more need for synthetic fertilizers. All right. Uh, but again, soil is something that can be managed. With the right practices, we can prevent or halt or even reverse some of the harmful effects of using soil for agriculture. Uh, so a great example is the American Dust Bowl. It's often blamed on Mother Nature. Now, uh, droughts happen. And yes, there was a drought during the bus Dust Bowl area in the 1920s, or 1930s, excuse me, um, and a pretty severe widespread drought. But the grasslands that are native to the American Midwest, where we have the Dust Bowl, are adapted to drought conditions. All right, and so under drought conditions, uh, grasses, you know, if you can picture this as the ground, they have the, the grass that goes above ground, but they also have this really extensive, what they call fibrous root system. All right, uh, it stays alive in, in droughts, it even stays alive with uh, periodic forest or grassland fires, right? So it might kill off that, that top grass, the blades of grass that we see above the ground, but those roots stay alive, even through extended droughts. Um, and what also happens is that fibrous root system, which builds up uh, organic material in humus, it protects that A horizon. So this would be kind of like our O horizon. It protects that A horizon from erosion. So when things dry out, if it's a fire and the top blades of grass dry, the soil beneath is protected. Okay? Uh, so we get into a severe drought situation. And lots of grasses are dying and so on. What happened in the Dust Bowl is we removed lots of native vegetation for agriculture. Um, and we didn't have crops in place that could survive drought and protect the soil. And so we couldn't grow crops um, because of so little availability of water. And um, because there was no crops holding the soil down and no grass holding the soil down, that A horizon was able to just slowly erode away, erode away. Uh, due to wind, all right, and they call it the American Dust Bowl because the wind was just able to pick up these particles and blow them away. So, as much as the Dust Bowl was caused by soil erosion, or excuse me, by drought, it was just as much due to human activity and poor soil management. All right, uh, I think we already talked about nutrient mineral depletion, but again. Uh, in a natural cycle, we've got nutrients into the plants, the plants die, we turn nutrients back to the soil, and we get this equilibrium. Now, when we harvest plants through agriculture, uh, very important for us, that's how we get our food, um, nutrients go into the plants and then leave with the harvested fruit, like tomatoes. All right? And over time, uh, rather than those nutrients returning to the soil, we would take those nutrients away in the form of food, and the soil becomes depleted in nutrients, in which case we need to then add more fertilizer back to that soil. And that could be organic fertilizer or compost or synthetic fertilizers. Um, but that's one of our issues. Okay, uh, another one in our arid areas, okay, is soil salinization. So um, we talked in chapter 14 about how a body of water can become salty over time because all fresh water has trace minerals in it, right? And um, when water evaporates, right, it leaves those minerals behind. Now, if we do something like flood irrigation, where we're continuously and frequently losing lots and lots of um, water to evaporation, the salt that's in the fresh water that we're using to flood irrigate in the first place gets left behind in the soil. And over time, through flooding and evaporation, flooding and evaporation, we lose 
uh, or we increase the amount of salt on the top layer of soil, and that's called soil salinization. Again, this is from improper irrigation techniques. Okay, uh, but again, where are we losing lots of water due to evaporation? Well, we're doing flood irrigation and also uh, in our particularly arid areas. Now, when it rains, for example, lots of those solute salts might dissolve in the rainwater and percolate through. Um, so it's not as much of a problem in our wetter areas. Uh, and now, why is that a problem? Of course, uh, salt can become toxic to plants at certain concentrations. So what was mud might be very fertile soil uh, becomes toxic to plants because of the buildup of salts. Um, so back to this idea of desertification. So again, it's the gradual uh, degradation of once fertile rangeland, typically what used to be grasslands. Um, and it turns it into essentially a desert in terms of how productive it is and the types of plants and animals that can, that can support it. All right? Um, typically, although climates can change over time, but typically desertification is a human-induced process. In other words, it's caused by humans. Okay? Um, oh, and sorry, I meant to say this. There's also sort of a little feedback mechanism here, right? Um, trees and plants themselves do contribute to climate and actually help increase uh, precipitation. So changes in the vegetation, right, um, can also cause changes in precipitation, which can go back and further exacerbate the problem. All right, so another so I'll throw back to some Chapter 5 uh, feedback mechanisms. All right, um, so soil conservation and policies in the U.S. And again, much of this was learned because of that nasty dust bowl we had back in the 1930s that contributed to the Great Depression. Right, so we enacted some policies to help uh, understand soil and its properties and how it works and also how we can go about maintaining it. Uh, so in 1935, we passed what's called the Soil Conservation Act. Um, so that caused the, or led to the formation of what's called the Soil Conservation Service, <clears throat> which is now, now called the Natural Resource Conservation Service. Um, and so there are agencies that go around and assess soil damage and develop policies to improve soil, uh, which also led to what's called the Conservation Reserve Program. Uh, and so you may, living in the Wall Valley, have heard of what they call CRP land, okay? And this is uh, what they call marginal land. So land uh, that has soil um, that's worthy of agriculture, but probably not our most productive spots. And so they take marginal lands um, that are highly erodible, um, and they actually pay farmers to not farm it. They pay farmers to go back and restore those marginal lands back to their native vegetation. And uh, in doing so, um, by preventing that erosion and and keeping the soil healthy, it helps maintain the entire system of the rest of the farm. Okay, now, why do they pay farmers to not farm? Um, it's a simple matter of economics. The, the farmers have no incentive to, to put land back to its natural state. Uh, the incentive is to farm it and grow crops and sell the crops for a profit, right? Uh, and so in paying the farmers to not farm certain land, uh, we keep our agricultural land safer and healthier, uh, but we also don't hurt the farmers in terms of their economic well-being. Um, and that's what they call conservation reserve or CRP land. Okay, and that's right here in the Wall Wall Valley. We've got quite a bit of it actually. Um, the other thing to talk about: we've done a couple of labs involving soil. Um, you know, we only got so much time, but essentially it comes down to physical versus chemical tests, physical soil tests are tested on soil that would don't involve uh, chemical reactions. So the little the lab we did where we poured water into the sand and gravel and so on, testing for porosity and permeability, those were physical tests. Chemical tests do involve some sort of chemical change to the soil. So the organic uh, matter test we did is an example of a chemical test. All right, so porosity, texture, moisture content are physical tests. Organic content, mineral content, pH tests, those would all be what we call chemical tests. Uh, so we did the organic contact test. Uh, so when testing for soil moisture, typically you, you would uh, pour some water into soil. And then over successive days without watering or irrigating the soil, 
you would see how much uh, water that soil is able to hold on to. Okay, uh, to test the pH, you just use a pH meter to test the acidity of the soil. Uh, let's see, porosity, we know how to do that. We did that together. And then mineral tests, there's like little kits. You can buy like a soil mineral test kit to test for nitrogen, phosphorus, or other trace minerals that you might be interested in. Okay, I uh, want to try to keep this slideshow to less than 15 minutes, but, um, you know, it's good to know various types of soil tests. You want to be able to differentiate between physical and chemical tests. Again, physical tests, just look at properties like water holding capability, how big are the particles. We're not actually doing chemical reactions. Uh, chemical tests do involve chemical reactions to test. Okay? I uh, think that's it. We will talk more about soil conservation and regeneration as a group tomorrow.